Chapter 12 22nd Sky Rangers Landing Zone Hesperus Free Sky Province, Lyran Alliance, 28th of June, 3065 Colonel Francisco de Argal watched the mission clock, bolted to a bulkhead on the 22nd Sky Ranger command dropship, tick down to zero. That's it, Don, he said quietly to his exec. Boost. Nix relayed the order to the dropship captain. A few seconds later, the big Overlord class mech hauler shook and groaned as the big engines buried deep inside their hull fought to overcome Hesperus Ree's gravity. About a kilometer to either side of the boosting ship, two more egg-shaped vessels began to rise on pillars of smoke and fire. Captain, the Argal called across the bridge. As soon as we're spaceborne, turn us inbound to Hesperus too. Put us on course for our alternate landing zone, and send a signal advising the main body of my decision. Aye, Colonel, the spacer acknowledged. The alternate, Colonel? Nix asked. Yes, I'm sure they prepared for us, the Argal said. The local militia might not be that clever, but we got to assume that the Grey Death Legion is. Even if that bastard Carlyle isn't in command anymore, his wife is just as much a veteran. She is going to figure out there's a hostile force in system and put her troops on high alert. That means the aerospace defenses at Maria's Elegy are gonna be primed and ready to fire at the first hint of an incoming dropship. If we divert to the alternate landing zone, we won't have to run that gauntlet. All we're gonna have to face is the Legion fighter wing. They might be good, but the most they can do is harass us on the way down. I really doubt they're gonna be able to stop free overlords, don't you? I agree, Colonel, Nix said. But I'm a little worried about the damage they'll do on the way down. So am I, Don, but we're gonna have to risk it. The Argal said with a slight shrug. And the risk of diverting to the alternate LZ is less than we'd face if we went in against a forewarned, in-placed enemy at the spaceport. At least this way we should be able to ground and start raising Kane before the main body arrives. With luck, we're gonna be able to draw the defenders away from Maria's elegy and the Defiance plant. What about the aerospace defenses? Nix insisted. They'll be intact when the main force arrives. True, but they'll know that, won't they? General von Frisch can divert or follow the plan as he wants. The Argal smiled grimly as another thought occurred to him. And don't forget, if the main body makes it in system past the Simon Davion, they'll be bringing at least one warship. I think that makes the odds a bit even, don't you? Colonel, we've got fighters closing in on our position, coming at 0505, zero five, zero five, Mark 135, the sensor operator reported. How many? The Argal looked at the dropship tactical display, early picking out the tiny red dagger icons representing the approaching attack craft. I'd say at least 12, Colonel, the sensor operator called back. Mixed weight classes, looks like they sent a full wing. Launch our fighters, the Argal said to the ship captain. Try to keep the enemy away from the dropships. Our weapons are free. Very well, Colonel, the spacer replied. Gunnery officer, weapons are free to engage the enemy. Flight ops, launch fighters. The dropship personnel had been anticipating the command. A deep ringing sound vibrated through the huge 9,700-ton vessel as a full squadron of fighters rocketed out of their launch bays. Immediately, six tiny blue daggers joined the trio of elongated, U-shaped icons representing the Sky Ranger dropships. An instant later, another dozen fighter icons flickered into existence, six around each of the two other dropships. Without hesitation, the fighters joined formation and streaked off on an intercept course with the inbound Red Force. Captain, attacking fighters are now at 325 kilometers, the sensor operator called out. Leading attackers targeted, the gunnery officer added. Engaging now. Along the overlord flanks, a pair of weapon ports snapped open and vomited fire as two volleys of long-range missiles streaked off into space. On the view screen, the effect of the missiles was less than impressive. 
the thin broken line showing the projectile's track passed the Ranger interceptors. A second later, the missiles intersected the two foremost red daggers, and the tracking lines winked out. The Argal knew that the reality of the situation was far more devastating, as forty high-explosive armor-piercing missiles, guided by sophisticated Artemis fire control systems, smashed into his missiles. He could imagine the silent, fiery blooms engulfing the targets, but he had no illusion that the inbound fighters would be destroyed or deterred by those heap volleys. On the view screen, the Grey Death Legion fighters bore in on the invaders. Wing Commander Julia Vargas flicked his SL-15 Slayer heavy fighter into a barrel roll. The nagging tone indicated the targeting lock died. Ahead of him, visible only as targeting discreets on his HUD, he saw the enemy fighter wing bearing down. He used a thumb control on the fighter control stick to designate the nearest fighter. His Warhook program identified it as a 60-ton Stingray, one of the workhorse fighters in the Lyran military. The two fighters were almost evenly matched in terms of speed and maneuverability, although the Slayer had heavier armor and greater firepower. The Stingray did have advantages, though. A sunspot particle projection cannon mounted in the nose, and a couple of large lasers set into the forward-swept wings. Those weapons gave the Stingray the ability to hit at longer distances than the relatively short-range medium lasers and Zeus 56 Type 10 autocannon carried by the Slayer. The Rebel pilot made his knowledge of his fighter's superior attack range clear as he laced Vargas's right wing with laser fire while the man-made lightning of a PPC bolt flickered across the void to smash into the Slayer's tail. But that was the only unanswered attack Vargas would allow the enemy. He flipped his fighter into another barrel roll, this one in the opposite direction. Coming out of the high-G maneuver, he toggled his controls to bring the Slayer into line with the enemy ship. A tap of his thumb sent a stream of cannon shells ripping into the Stingray's nose. A quintet of medium lasers clawed blackened furrows into its fuselage, one tracing a line of carbon and melted armor up across the cockpit fairing. The rebel pilot jinked, throwing his fighter into a wing over and then rolling into a split S. At a combined speed of 4,000 kilometers an hour, the fighters flashed past each other and diverged. Vargas fought the instinct to pitch up into an Immelman turn and pursue the Slayer. He knew the primary target had to be the Overlord-class dropships. It was a difficult decision to make. Left to their own devices, the Rebel fighters would swing around on the squadron tail and begin hammering the Legion fighters to pieces. At the same time, the dropship heavy guns would be executing a serious toll on the defending fighters. Still, there was little choice in the matter. The attacking mech haulers had to be engaged and damaged, destroyed if possible. The Slayer bore in hard on the nearest dropship, trying to close range as quickly as possible. Taking on a massive, heavily armed spacecraft was tricky business. The vessels had tough hides and few vulnerable spots. Lasers, PPC fire, and missiles reached out to swat out at the inbound Legion fighters. One flight of missiles peppered the Slayer, but did little more than burn the dark grey paint and knock a few chips off the Warbird's tough hide. Glancing at the display, Vargas saw that his wingman, Lieutenant Patrick Garrity, was right behind him. Come on, Pat, Vargas called. Let's hit them where it counts. Vargas hauled back on the stick, pulling the Slayer up into a spiraling climb along the Overlord's ovoid flank. As the fighter flashed past the transport squared off stern, Vargas teased on the roll and nosed over, aiming his fighter at the center of the ship's engineering section. Coming in directly behind the dropship was one way to attack it at the most vulnerable. The rear armor, although massive when compared to that of a relatively tiny aerospace fighter, was usually thinner and the weapons less powerful. Still, the incredible energy put out by the dropship drives could burn an attack craft to cinder if the pilot chose the wrong moment to fire up the engines. Vargas braved the possibility of instant extinction and dove on the dropship's stern. The autocannon and lasers hammered away at the vessel's armor, but accomplished nothing. As he pulled away from the ship, Garrity repeated the attack, again with little to no effect. 
It would take more than a pass by a couple of fighters to significantly inconvenience this armored monster. A pair of laser beams from the gun emplacements on the dropship's stern punched holes in the Slayer's starboard vertical stabilizer, while a PPC savaged the fighter nose. Vargas had been so intent on attacking one dropship that he'd wandered off into a crossfire. Looking up, he saw a battle-scarred stingray bearing down upon him. The Legion chief fighter pilot whipped the big Delta Wing fighter into a tight bank to the left, turning away from the dropship laser fire. He hoped the enemy gunners had read all the textbooks instructing a fighter to turn into an anti-aircraft battery fire, because most gun crews could not reverse their tracking quickly enough. The gunners must have been anticipating a textbook evasive maneuver, because the next shots ripped into empty space half a kilometer behind the Slayer. The Stingray pilot, however, was not fooled. He rolled the agile craft onto Vargas' tail and blasted a long, smoking gouge in the fighter's body just forward of the rear-facing laser mount. Vargas lined up the aft gun and let fly with a single bolt of amplified light energy before going into a snap roll, followed by a tight weaving turn. The stingray hung onto his tail as though tethered by a cable. Pat, how about some help? Sorry, sir, Garrity replied. The breathlessness in his voice suggested he was straining against increased g-forces caused by maneuvering at high speed. He's got friends, and they want to play too. Vargas targeted the stingray with another hit from the aft laser, and then kicked the pedal rudder left hard. The stars and the planets outside the cockpit canopy suddenly exchanged places, as the slayer yawed suddenly to port. Vargas held the stick absolutely still as he fought the centrifugal forces that slammed him against the side of the cockpit. He pulled the throttle back to neutral and gritted his teeth against the G-forces staring at his consciousness. He again stomped on the rudder pedals, this time snapping the big fighter out of its flat spin, leaving the ship flying backward through the vacuum of space. Unlike fighters operating in atmosphere, those in freefall were able to perform such maneuvers if the pilot was skilled enough and lucky enough to carry it off. The stingray was directly in front of the slayer's nose, less than 10 kilometers away. Forcing himself to think backward to compensate for the reverse motion of the ship, Vargas lined his sights on the stingray narrow silhouette. His fingers caressed the controls, and a hellstorm of laser and cannon fire poured into the enemy ship. The stingray shuddered and went into a lazy roll to starboard. Vargas flipped the slayer end for end to bring her back into a normal flight profile. Looping back around to engage the battered F-90, he saw there was no need for further attacks. The Stingray's cockpit was gone, the canopy blasted open by cannon shells. Vargas didn't know if the pilot managed to eject, and at that moment he didn't have the time to search for the enemy flyer. Pulling around, he spotted Garrity's fighter. Although sorely abused by the rebel ships, it was still in operation. Vargas dove on the enemy ships, forcing them to break away from the Legion fighter to avoid his attack. In the momentary respite his dive afforded him, Vargas looked around. The dropships were over 200 kilometers away, their lead increasing every second. Most of the Legion fighters were still in the battle, but then so were most of the rebels. And then he saw it. Legion 1, this is Eagle 1, he radioed. We are not able to stop the dropships. They are still inbound. I say again, the dropships are still inbound. And Colonel, I don't think they're headed for the spaceport. It looks like the enemy is headed south and west of the port. I don't think they intend to ground at the Defiance plant. Legion 1 to Eagle 1, Lori's voice said in his ear. Ground tracking stations confirm inbound's heading. Any chance we can shadow them and let us know where they land? A trip hammer explosion rocked Vargas' fighter as a couple of Chippewa fighters moved to engage him and his mate. Negative, Legion 1, Vargas said, as he whipped the slayer into a series of evasive maneuvers. He felt the leaden disappointment. This was the first time he had so utterly failed his commander. We are outnumbered and outgunned. If we try to follow the dropships, we're going to lose the entire wing. Very well, Eagle 1, Lori said flatly. Vargas imagined he could hear a tone of reproach in the simple words. 
break off and return to base. No sense wasting any more lives. I'm sure we're gonna catch up with them on the ground. Colonel, they're breaking off. Yes, they are Galk Road. He hadn't needed the sensor operator's joyous call. He'd seen the Grey Death Legion fighters turn away from the dropships. Communication officer, prepare to send a zip squeal message to General von Frisch. Advise him that we are heading for the alternate landing zone, and we will execute Plan Bravo upon grounding. As the youth manning the communication console acknowledged the order and began to ready the compressed burst transmission, the Argal allowed himself a grin of pleasure. Diverting to the alternate landing zone would change the pace of the campaign, but beating the Grey Death Legion aerospace fighters was a good omen. The Sky Rangers had a fighting chance to seize Asperus too. With the fall of that vital world, the entire Isle of Sky would gain its freedom. Chapter 13 Melrose Valley, Hesperus II, Sky Province, Lyran Alliance, 28th of June, 3065 The green-spoked wheel of the targeting reticule floated across the HUD as Francisco de Argal lined up his thugs, right-hand mounted PPC, on a big prefabricated sheet metal barn. For an instant or so, he held his fire, feeling a momentary twinge of guilt at the idea of using the assault mech's incredible firepower to destroy a civilian target. Pushing the emotion back into the box he had constructed for it in his mind, he squeezed the trigger. The coruscating bolt of azure fire ripped into the barn's fin pressed aluminum wall. For an instant, it seemed that the charged particles had no more effect on the barn than to leave a slagged hole the size of a man's torso in their wake. Then the Argal caught sight of a few thin wisps of black smoke drifting out of the ragged wound in the building's side. Soon, the THG-2E's infrared sensors began to glow as the crops stored inside, ignited by the PPC blast, began to burn. He sent another stroke of artificial lightning into the barn before turning away. Across the broad, flat valley, he saw at least a score of thick columns of black smoke. Each one marked a pyre similar to the one he just ignited. This was Plan Bravo, which called for the 22nd Rangers to ground here in Melrose Valley, the center of Asperus II's primary farming area, and began tearing up everything in sight. Eventually, the Grey Death Legion and the regular Lyran forces on planet would have to come to stop the destruction of the planet's source of food. The hope was to draw the planet's defenders away from Maria's elegy and the nearby Defiance plant at about the time the incoming fourth Sky Rangers would arrive on Hesperus II. It was a risky plan, but then everything about the Duke Robert's plan to seize Hesperus II and the rest of the Isle of Sky was risky. The likely payoff, freedom for the region, was worth the gamble. Many of the warriors under the Argal's command subscribed to a liberty-at-any-cost attitude when it came to the rebellion. To some degree, he agreed with them. Destroying a few farms in the Melrose Valley was intended as a ruse, a ploy to draw the defenders of Esperus away from their base of operation. The Argal knew it would take more than a few hours to seriously endanger the entire valley's food supply, though. It was up to him to convince the Legion and the regular LAF troopers that he and his men would not stop destroying farms and crops until the defenders came out to meet them. Colonel, this is Owl-6. We got company. The message came from one of the reconnaissance lances the Argal had deployed along the valley. The recon elements would give the rangers some warning when the defenders finally massed to oppose them. Go ahead, Owl-6. The Argal said. What have you got? Stand by. The reply was broken by the harsh chatter of machine gun fire. Local milis, Colonel, the scout said, using the slang term for planetary militias. Mostly some light and medium X, a couple of tanks, and a whole bunch of infantry. Nothing too heavy, but a bit much for just us to take on. We could use some help. The Argal looked at the electronic map programmed into one of the thugs' secondary multiple function displays. Owl 6 was just a few kilometers east of the position. Hold them as best you can, Owl 6, he said. Help is on the way. 
Switching the communicator over to the channel reserved for the regimental command lance, he sent a new message. Command lance, form up on me. We're going Milliz hunting. As the lance mates acknowledged the order, the Argal pushed the control sticks forward, setting his fog off in a rolling trot towards the embattled recon lance. As the ugly, almost simian-looking mech loped across the valley, its broad, flat feet kicked deep gouges in the fertile black soil. A pang of regret pricked his conscience. Every barn burned, every field trampled was an injury done to the farmers of the region for which the new sky government would have to reckon. But such were the costs of war for independence. As the command lance crested a low hillock, he caught sight of the skirmish between the recon lance and the local volunteer troops. The millets were pressing the scout element hard. The Argal could tell that the superior numbers would soon take a toll on the lightly armed and armored recon max, unless he and the command lance moved to prevent it. Bringing the sights of his fog to rest on the slab-sided profile of a militia enforcer, the Argal stroked the triggers and sent a couple of PPC blasts into the enemy mech. The temperature in the cockpit spiked upward as the power-hungry weapons spattered deadly bolts at the lighter machine. For several minutes, it was hard to breathe the overheated air, until the high-efficiency heat sinks in the mech legs and lower torso bled away enough of the waste heat generated by the T-Guard PPCs. The enforcer staggered under the enormous impact of the charged particle stream. More than a ton of armor had melted away or blasted off by the star-hot blast. But the millet's pilot was obviously a veteran. The medium mech took a long, gliding step to the side, getting its feet back under it. For a moment, the machine stood still, its posture suggesting that of a man searching for something he could not quite see. Like a pistol fighter aiming his weapon, the enforcer extended his left arm, and a lance of energy snapped from the extended range large laser in the hand. The beam was only visible as a bright blue thread, where it intersected the thin smoke drifting across the battlefield. The effect on the thug's armor was far more palpable. A deep smoking pit was burned into the hunch-shouldered assault mech right knee by the laser's invisible touch. Further reinforcing the illusion of a pistolier, the enforcer retracted his left arm while extending its right. Flame gouted from the business end of the dual-purpose autocannon. Submunitions showered the Argal's mech chipping away armor across the chest and left side. Ton for ton, the enforcer had given as good as it got, but the Argal was not willing to settle for an even exchange. He selected a thug's secondary weapon system, a pair of relatively heat-efficient six-tube Baikal short-range missile racks. At the touch of a firing stud, a dozen missiles rained down on the enforcer. When the smoke and flame of the detonating warheads dissipated, the Argal could easily see the damage he had wrought on the enemy machine. All of the armor was gone from the gangly mech's left leg. Reddish-gray strands of mimer, the artificial muscles that gave a mech its strength and mobility, hung in tatters from the wound. And the Argal could see cracks in the enforcer's metal leg bones. Another hit and you're finished, he said silently to himself, carefully aiming his right-hand PPC at the enforcer's mangled leg. The millet's pilot must have known it too. Before the Argal could fire, the enforcer raised its arms in a gesture of surrender. Almost simultaneously, the heat signature representing the Magna 250 extra light fusion plant in the enemy mech's chest began to fade as the pilot powered down the machine. Accepting the surrender, the Argal set off in search of new prey, but found none. The arrival of his assault mech-equipped command lance had broken the militia's back, as well as their will to fight. What few combat machines remained of them were streaming northeastward towards the imagined safety of the Mayu Mountains. Well, they would be safe there, the Argal thought, so long as they don't come back to try to take on him again. Colonel, we have confirmed contact with the enemy, Chief Sellar said cupping her hand over the in-ear comm unit she was wearing. They're out in the Melrose Valley, burning crops and destroying barns. Lori frowned. That doesn't make sense. They wouldn't drop out in Melrose if they were intent on capturing the planet. They would hit Maria's elegy, wouldn't they? Or Defiance, or even During. 
Why would they drop onto the planet's biggest farming area? Realization followed quickly. Unless they're trying to draw us away from the spaceport. She nodded to herself. Chief, keep trying to track down General Kiampa and send a message to General Zambos. Tell him to expect a main invasion force any hour. I'll send my 2nd Battalion out to Melrose. Also, contact Major Guri. Tell him we confirmed a hostile force on planet. I suspect he already knows, but tell him anyway. The blood drained from Selar's dark face, and she gripped the back of a chair to keep from falling. Chief, are you all right? Lori asked, taking the woman by the elbow and helping her onto the seat. We just lost contact with the Simon Davion, Selar said. Her last transmission indicated that the rebels were trying to board her. I'm afraid she's been captured. Chief, we're getting something on the distress band, a tech cried out. Let me hear it. Selars leaned forward in the chair, one hand pressed over her ear, and then she sat up and motioned to the tech to cut off the feed. That's enough, she said. What is it? Lori asked. More rebels? No, nothing so clean, Selars whispered. The Simon Davian must be in enemy hands. She just turned her guns on the Carolyn, a Defiance Industries jump ship. Her engines are out and she's losing station keeping. Her captain ordered her abandoned and is calling for rescue. They hit a civilian jump ship, McCall said, stunned. Colonel, the invidious. Lori was half a beat ahead of him. She snatched up a communication headset, ordering the technician to establish contact with the Great Death Legion jump ship. Captain Murad, get the Invidious out of the system, she screamed as soon as the starship commander came online. Lori knew that shouting did little good, but this time she couldn't help it. The message would take nearly ten minutes to make the long journey out to the Invidious' berth at the Zenith jump point. Too late, Colonel, Murad said, when her reply came in almost twenty minutes later. Her face was tight with anger and pain. Right after they shot up the Carolyn, those bastards turned their guns on us. The Invidious is finished. Her KF drive is nothing but a pile of junk, and her back is broken. I'm ordering her abandoned and scuttled. I've also ordered the other Legion jump ships to surrender rather than be destroyed. I doubt there's any chance of us getting picked up by friendlies, so I guess I'll see you when the war is over. Lori slammed her fist into the console, swearing. Lieutenant Colonel McCall, she growled between clenched teeth. Tell Major Huck to move 2nd Battalion aboard the dropships. Send Captain Radcliffe's 1st Armored Infantry Company with them. I want them to go to Melrose and pound those Separatist bastards into the ground, and I want their commander's head on a pike. 